Welcome to the American Monetary Association's podcast, where we explore how monetary policy impacts the real lives of real people and the action steps necessary to preserve wealth and enhance one's lifestyle. Welcome to the podcast for the American Monetary Association. This is your host, Jason Hartman, and this is a service of my private foundation, the Jason Hartman Foundation. Today, we have a great interview for you, so I think you'll enjoy it. And comment on our website or our blog post. We have a lot of resources there for you, and you can find that at AmericanMonetaryAssociation.org. That's AmericanMonetaryAssociation.org, or the website for the foundation, which is JasonHartmanFoundation.org. Thanks so much for listening, and please visit our website and enjoy our extensive blog and other resources there. It's my pleasure to welcome James West to the show. Mr. West is the writer and executive producer of a fantastic new movie, and I'm looking forward to sharing this with all of you listeners. James, welcome to the show. Thanks very much for having me. Tell us about your new movie coming out. The title of the film is Crime of the Century, it's a feature-length documentary film that examines the relationship between monetary policies of global governments and the financial boom and bust cycles that uh, typically permeate the economic business cycles over the last 150 years. Now, that's a very interesting topic because I assume you're going to talk in the film about the Federal Reserve and its involvement in our economy. Wasn't that one of the things that the Federal Reserve really sort of promised when they pitched the idea back in the early 1900s as an end to these harsh cycles? Well, exactly. And the thinking back then was that uh, the last panic before the establishment of the U.S. Federal Reserve was the one that occurred in 1907. And that one got underway because of a panic with copper stocks. And what happened was J.P. Morgan led a consortium of bankers to uh, lend money, essentially, to other banks at the bequest of the government, because otherwise these other banks and brokerage firms were going to fail. And the perception of government at the time was, well, we can't be seen going cap in hand to the bankers every time there's a liquidity problem in the financial market. This needs to be a government solution, not a private banking solution. That was the logic, anyways, that drove the establishment of the U.S. Federal Reserve uh, from the government side. Which, oddly enough, turned out to be a private bank anyway, right? Exactly. Well, J.P. Morgan stipulated at the time that he would help establish the U.S. Federal Reserve as long as it was run by bankers, not by government representatives. That is actually the, the key moment in time where you know, we had an opportunity to have what properly should be a government-run issuer of our monetary policy and, and money, uh, but instead it turned out to be a private organization. It is really amazing the way this country seems to be held hostage to its central bank. These private people and foreign banks also are benefiting from the misery of us, the people, we the people, you know, our, our currency is being devalued, our taxes are going up, our government is broke. It seems like we would be at least hitting on one cylinder right, but it seems like every cylinder is going the wrong direction, does it not? It sure does. And again, that's something we try to examine in the film, is that the entire episode as it unfolds seems to be a case of whoops, and oh, this was an accident, and we, we made this mistake, and we made that mistake. But the premise of this film is that you, if you look back over the last 150 years, once big business sort of got married to banking, and banking started to influence the direction of government and what was allowed and what wasn't allowed, there's a pattern that we've identified in that the bankers tend to flood the system with liquidity because their product, what drives more money into their pockets than anything else, is the extension of credit. So as creditors, their product is money. So when the economy uses lots of money, the bankers are at the top of that food chain, and they extract fees and percentages and all of this all the way along, and now derivatives. And so it's very much within their interest to see the growth phase of the business cycle overcapitalize so that you drive prices up much higher than you would normally see for both commodities and for other asset classes like stocks and their derivatives. And when they decide that the system has grown out of control, 
then they contract the availability of credit. The system goes into a free fall, and they mop up the assets that have become so quickly devalued and that the builders of those assets can no longer afford to hang on to because suddenly they're over-leveraged. Their credit's no good. And so that is the crime of the century, in our view, is that the overcapitalization of the system is a pattern that we see happening again and again. Right now I'm reading about the financial panic of 1907 and the similarities in some of the loans that are being extended to save financial institutions. I mean, if you read the New York Times in that period, you would think you're reading the New York Times of the last six weeks. I mean, it's just so identical, except then they're talking millions. Now we're talking billions and trillions. It's really amazing. So that, that's a very interesting concept on the crime of the century, which is the title for your film. So what you're saying is that what they're doing is they're flooding the markets with credit. All this money floods the system. You have too many dollars chasing a limited supply of you know goods and services. And so we're talking really about goods or assets. So asset prices rise. So we've seen that with housing, stocks, some areas of the precious metals market, certainly, and other things. And these prices rise, then they contract the credit, asset prices fall, as they're doing now, and then they go in, these bankers and so forth, and the various elites, and buy up these assets on the cheap. That's, right. that's the story, right? That's right. That is the crime Which of the we- century. That is one of the crimes of the century. Yeah. You know, we saw that happen with Merrill Lynch, Wachovia. The banks that have collapsed and disappeared and been absorbed are far too numerous to mention in a single conversation. But everybody will remember that during the course of the summer of 2007, Goldman Sachs came out and said oil was at that time was trading at $70, which was just mind-boggling in 2007. And Goldman Sachs came out and said, well, you think $70 is bad, we predict that you're going to see $100 a barrel within the next two years. Well, what happened was, as soon as they issued that statement, oil raced up over $100 right away. Within the next two weeks, it topped $100. So they used the media to sort of create perception on our part that, wow, it's going much higher. So another part of the crime of the century is that some financial institutions are so large and so far up the ladder that they don't sort of react to the market. They drive market behavior, and they know when they say something that they're going to elicit a certain kind of behavior by all the layers of the financial players underneath them. So that if you come out in your Goldman Sachs and you say gold's going to go to 100, well, then all of the private equity firms that are also commodities traders are going to rush out and bid up oil futures because... The perception is that, well, if Goldman Sachs said oil is going higher, oil is going higher. So they, they create the reality by putting it out there that, hey, this is what's going to happen, so that's what happens. You know, isn't that always true that any big player in any type of market makes a market to some extent? Of course, if Trump says he's going to buy up a bunch of land in a certain area, won't that cause people to follow and react? That's not inherently bad, is it? Well, that's completely contrary to, for one thing, to the Sherman Antitrust Act. I mean, the whole point of diversity of markets is to prevent monopolization of markets so no single entity can have that great an influence on any given market. Well, I I certainly agree with you with that. The trust should be busted, no question, but the trust is a matter of degree. You know, should someone have 10% of the market, 20%, 50% of the market? How much is too much? Obviously, 100% is way too much, but you're always going to have large and small players. And so this would say that the central planners and the consolidation of the banking world is bad. And I'm certainly going to agree with you there. But you're always going to have larger and smaller players, and they'll always influence to to some extent, right? True. But when it comes to the currency of the world, and you've only got, we're talking the U.S. dollar, which is now the reserve currency of the world. And ostensibly, you've got the Federal Reserve and the Treasury acting in the interests of the U.S. citizenry to protect its value and to protect our interests. We've certainly seen that as a big myth, right? (laughs) Well, exactly. So instead, what's actually happening is you've got the layer of banks above government, which is J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs, was bearing, but the derivatives of the Rothschilds and the derivatives of the Rockefellers, which is Citibank. And you've got that layer 
sort of operating in collusion with the U.S. Federal Reserve because that's a private institution, and they dictate the terms under which they think things should happen to the Treasury. And so it comes out as government policy and government decisions, but the pattern is that there's a layer operating above government here, and key to their continuation of this ongoing cycle of boom and bust is the suppression of gold. And really, that's at the key of our film here, is that this whole thing couldn't happen if gold was allowed to trade in an unfettered manner. Yeah, I definitely agree with you that there's lots of manipulation. I just want to go back to your thought, though, earlier on what is really the big crime of the century, which is drive up asset prices, plunge asset prices, you know, manipulate markets, in other words, and then buy up assets on the cheap when markets are low. It's an interesting concept. If we want to just look at that a little more closely, though, we have to see a point, though, if that crime of the century is going to work, where the asset prices are cheaper than they were at the previous low, or at least in inflation-adjusted terms, they are cheaper than they were, to make that work and to make that enrich the, the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers and so forth. So if you take the Dow, the Dow is... It's much lower. It's off its high, for sure. Even when it was at its high, I was saying that, you know, that was sort of an illusion really created by inflation in the dollar or, well, deflation in the value of the dollar, but inflation, as it's called, which is kind of a misnomer in many ways. But, you know, we don't see asset prices cheaper than where they were yet. I mean, are you saying we will? That has to be the case to enrich people. I mean, they can get people to pay higher prices buy at the peak, asset prices are inflated, credit contracts, and then the big banks and all the big players and the elites come in and buy cheap later, but they're not buying cheaper than the last low, are they? It's not so much that they're paying the price as quoted on the Dow, but what happens is, for example, in the case of, say, Warren Buffett's $10 billion investment in AIG, okay. shortly after... Paulson decided that they were going to invest a further $10 billion in AIG. I'm not sure if it was AIG now or J.P. Morgan or one of the banks, but the terms under which the Treasury invested some of its bailout money were far more onerous than Buffett experienced for his investment. And so, you know... It so, wasn't, so the taxpayers wasn't... are paying to increase the price of Buffett's investment, right? Is that what you're getting at? Well, essentially, yeah, it, yeah. It, it, the cost of his investment is being offset by public money. Mm -hmm. And so the other thing is the share price that he's paying to buy into this entity would never be so low if the company was not in such a state of distress. It's in the position that it needs the money or it's going to fold. So the offering price of the securities in exchange for the investment are far lower than they would be in normal times and far lower than what the average investor has put into it while the economy was functioning normally. And so that's where the whole asset doesn't necessarily disappear, but what happens is control positions and large ownership positions are obtained by elite financial interests who take advantage of the the stress that these companies find themselves in. This is really interesting, you know, because what really is happening there is a transfer of wealth from the middle class investor who rode the market, did all the things that I call it the vast Wall Street conspiracy tells us to do, invest for the long term, you know, buy a stupid mutual fund, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's always that middle part of the populace that did all that. They stuck their 401ks in it, et cetera, et cetera. And then they lost the value and essentially transferred that wealth to the elite, to Buffett, to the other players, because they drove up the price of that asset. It's really just unbelievable. And of course, it's incumbent upon them to keep this huge PR machine out there. You know, you see Warren Buffett go on and say, I'm buying up stocks right now. So every typical middle class investor probably thinks, oh, you know, if Buffett is doing it, then I should too. But, you know, he's in on the game. I mean, <laughs> this is, it's well, like exactly. he, he comes out of a meeting with Bernanke and Paulson and says, well, yeah, buy stocks in American companies. Well, <laughs> You know, of course he's going right. to say that. That's because he just got them for cheap and he needs somebody to sell them to. Yeah, right. <laughs> Very good. I love the simplicity yeah. of your statement right there. That's excellent. Tell well, us what else is involved in this crime of the century, if you will. Well, 
essentially our position is that there are four key mechanisms to this cycle. There's the U.S. Federal Reserve System, which is sort of a private gateway through which these bankers influence monetary policy. There's the fact of the U.S. dollar being the global reserve currency of having no choice, really, is what the situation is now. Then there's the depression of gold. You know, if gold is allowed to trade freely, typically it's the canary in the coal mine when, it, when a currency is being over-diluted, when they're printing too much. Typically, gold goes up in relation to any currency, indicating that the investment world perceives that there's too much currency relative to the amount of gold that's out there, and so people start to sell the currency and buy the gold, which drives the price up. Gold is supposed to be the consistent measuring stick, and of course it's not in today's world because it's manipulated. Yeah, exactly. It's manipulated right now, but if you step back to a geological sense of time, for our brief snippet of recorded history, call it 5,000 years, gold has been the standard by which all things of value are measured. It's always a case of, well, how much gold can you get with X with that currency, with those seashells, with the whiskey, you know. Right. It's always been about the gold. And so certainly now gold is suppressed and has been for, call it the last 30, 40 years since the advent of the gold carry trade, which we'll get to in a moment. But gold has always been that monetary standard. And we right now we're living in a time where it's popularly perceived to be a barbarous relic, not something that's practical, it's merely a commodity, it's just a metal that has no value in anything except jewelry. And, you know, that's all going to change because the one thing that's happening now is that with the currency becoming so diluted and gold, even though it's being suppressed with every effort on the part of the major futures exchanges or rather the central banks, the imbalance is reaching an explosive point. We're seeing that certainly with the near default of COMEX that seems to be unfolding. And so eventually the price of gold is going to explode. When that happens, the U.S. dollar is going to plummet. And so part of this strategy is the suppression of gold. And then the fourth thing would be the unregulated derivatives market, which is part of how they keep the price of gold suppressed. And we won't go into too much detail there because that's just so arcane that I've put everybody to sleep within 10 minutes of talking about how the derivatives trade works to suppress the perceived price of gold or the spot price of gold. That's fascinating, though. I hope you cover that in the film, do you? Because I really can't wait to hear more of that. Well, we do touch on it, but if we were to explain it in its full depth, two-thirds of the audience would not be interested, I don't think. They'd become very bored. The only thing you have to know about derivatives is it's gambling. So think of the derivatives market as a giant Las Vegas casino. Two things about gambling in Las Vegas. The house always wins, and you always leave with nothing. It's amazing how some people still don't realize that, huh? <laughs> That's right. If I make you think that the chips in this casino are better than that casino down the street, you're going to come and play in this casino. So that's what they've done with gold, is they've made it look like, well, there's no point in playing with gold because it's just so volatile and so unpredictable, and the market's so small, and it's, there's just no point in even being here. So that's the perception that's successfully been perpetrated for the most part throughout the United States. Now, there's a small part of the population who sort of see through that, and that's where the upward pressure on gold is coming from, from them, as well as more substantially from countries like Saudi Arabia, China, Russia, etc., First of all, the reserve currency issue. You know, the dollar has been the world's reserve currency for decades now. Why is the world willing to accept the dollar as the reserve currency when it continues to be debased and debased and debased? And, I mean, it's not like the whole world is that stupid that they don't know that we're mismanaging our currency and, and our whole government and economy in general. Why are we still the reserve currency? I, I sort of can't believe everybody's agreeing to that still. To understand that, we've got to look at how we became the reserve currency, and that was a process that occurred through the Bretton Woods Act of 1944, which was, in fact, also oversaw management of the gold standard. So at that time, gold was pegged to $35, and the U.S. said, well, our money will back the gold, and so that if you want to redeem or you want to trade in gold, then much easier if you just do it through the U.S. dollar. And so because the United States was the arbiter of the gold standard, you don't want to trade in gold, we'll use U.S. dollars. So you use the similar amount in U.S. dollars, 
to sort of pay for things like oil, and from oil it just sort of branched out from there. It was really the advent of the big oil industry, which saw U.S. dollars start to accumulate representative of a certain amount of gold, theoretically, so that it wasn't so much that countries were willing to take U.S. dollars as they thought they were taking something that represented a value relative to gold. So that's how, because of the billions and billions of barrels of oil that have been sort of taken out of the ground since the early 1900s, we'll say, that's what sort of built up the U.S. as a reserve currency globally. Now, at this point, we've got two interesting phenomenon happening is that you've got the G8 with a major portion of the U.S. treasuries and U.S. denominated assets held in foreign reserves. So they see that, well, we've got a grossly elevated dollar value presently because of the financial crisis that has caused the repatriation of U.S. dollars en masse because suddenly all these firms around the world who have been trading in U.S. dollars that have been leveraged out at 10 to 1 and 20 to 1 and 31, now they're being forced to deleverage, which means they're selling assets, which means they need U.S. dollars, which is putting undue demand on the U.S. dollar currency, which makes it look like it's very strong right now. That is a critical understanding right there. These U.S. dollars are being soaked up in abundance right now around the world as various funds and institutions unwind their investments and their over-leveraging, and that is causing a false dollar strength, in our opinion. Okay, so I agree with you there. Also, sort of add to the upward pressure on the U.S. dollar, Right now, because gold is so widely perceived as, well, that should be the safe haven sort of investment during times of financial trouble, but it hasn't been performing that way. So a lot of people who would traditionally gravitate towards that as a safe haven investment are staying away and instead putting their money in U.S. treasuries, which, again, only adds to the demand for U.S. dollars, which gives them some justification between the U.S. Federal Reserve and the Treasury Department to continuously come up with these trillion dollar bailout packages because it looks like the dollar is strong and it looks like it's only getting stronger. But we are almost at the peak of that process and, you know, it's going to probably coincide with Barack Obama taking the office in January that suddenly the dollar is going to go the other way. And when that happens, you know, you're going to see two things happen. You're going to see the dollar plummet as gold rockets. And People are, are very critical of that statement because gold bugs have been saying that for the last 10 years. Well, they've been saying it for That's a lot it. longer than that. They were saying it in the 70s, and they were true for a time. You know, they were saying that right. in the 80s, and they were wrong. They were saying that in most of the 90s, they were wrong. What this really reminds me of on the gold thing is that quote, and I don't know who said it off the top of my head. I can look it up, but it said this, the market can remain irrational longer than you can remain solvent can't remember who said that offhand. But can the gold price be manipulated longer than we can wait for a return? Because I just don't think gold is the solution. It should be. It makes sense that it is. It's totally logical. I completely understand the thinking. But the powers that be are so powerful. And they're getting more and more powerful. I mean, Paulson is like the world's global financial czar, at least until he retires. It's like there's a fourth branch of government now. I call it the financial branch. <laughs> you know, you know, we've got the, yeah. you know, we've got the uh, judicial, the legislative, the executive, and the financial. <laughs> I mean, right. it's crazy. This is what inspired the whole idea of doing this as a film. Was that I was talking to Bill Murphy at GATA, which is the Gold Antitrust Action Committee. That's the group that's more or less been jumping up and down and screaming about the manipulation scheme and the yeah. gold carry trade. They, they've been filing bit. lawsuits and talking about it and exactly. nothing's happening, you know. Exactly. And I said, you know, this feels like the Matrix, because I just started talking to him because I suddenly felt that, wait a sec, the world is not as it seems. And just like in the Matrix, when the character Neo, he's sort of going about his business and uh, Morpheus comes to him and says, well, haven't you always felt that something's not quite right? And here, if you eat this blue pill, you'll figure it all out, and if you don't want to know, just eat the red pill. Well, it seems to me that nine-tenths of Americans haven't been presented with a choice, and the one-tenth that have have chosen to eat the red pill and go back to sleep, and the blue pill is being consumed by very few people. But that's essentially what's happening, is we've got this great facade of everything under control, and 
some people have said to me in the past, well, if the government can suppress the price of gold for so long, what's to stop them from doing it indefinitely? Maybe really. another 10 years. What if you need to retire in 10 years, you know? Can you be a precious metals investor? I don't think that's possible, because if you follow all the research that's been published by the various analysts who have been following what's going on in the gold suppression scheme, all of that gold has come from the central banks. Now, they must be out of that gold, and that's why COMEX is close to capitulation, is because they've got gold on hand, which is registered ounces. And before last Friday, the amount of gold they had on hand as registered ounces was, I believe, 2.6 million ounces. Well, every Friday, the CFTC, the Commodities and Futures Trading Commission, issues their Commitment of Traders report, which tells you what are the contract positions of the various non-commercial traders in the futures market. And they do this for all the futures. Well, what happens typically every Friday, you see that approximately 1% of, of the trades want to take delivery of their commodity gold on the due date of the contract. You said one-third? No, sorry, 1%. So yeah. only 1% of the people actually take delivery off of the COMEX right. or the NYMEX. So that means that 99% of the people are basically engaging in another kind of fiat money system, just like the, uh, you know, the Federal Reserve and the Treasury play. Well, if you look at the $697 trillion notional value of the entire CFTC trading scheme, you'll start to understand where has all this negative value been accumulating and that is the great white elephant in the room. However, not to digress <laughs> excessively here, what happened was two Fridays ago, 5% of the closing contracts decided they wanted to take physical delivery. And some of those contracts that wanted physical delivery were HSBC and J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs. So now these are the guys who are typically, they have the bulk of the short contracts. Now they're demanding delivery of the closed long contracts seems to indicate a, a conflict within the system. But what it actually is, is that even the banks themselves are starting to demand physical delivery for what gold is left because they know that the COMEX is about to collapse. And when that happens, either the federal government is going to have to step in and make good on all of that gold that's supposed to be delivered that's not there. So it'll be the next bailout. Or it'll be the next bailout, or they'll just say, Sorry, we can't afford to bail that out. It's going to have to collapse. Right. So if that happens, you know, then you've got to ask yourself, well, what happens to the other futures contract? We're talking $697 trillion in futures contracts under the domain of the CFTC. Which is I mean, larger than the economy of the globe in many years, is my understanding. I can't remember what the global GDP is, but that's a giant exactly. number. Exactly. That's, okay. that's an amount that nobody but nobody can afford to bail out unless we are all to say, well, okay, this has all been fake and this is all imaginary and we're just going to go on and pretend that you know, money can be printed in perpetuity and there will be no effect. But the ultimate effect of this, all of this thing is this is the biggest effect, and this is where the real crime is, is that we're taking too much out of our capacity to create from the planet and that capacity is coming at the expense of future generations. And that capacity is being generated because these, this financial elite, this one breed of human being at the top of the food chain, doesn't know when to say, thanks, I've got enough, I'm gone. It's just a machine that has now taken on the idea of creating wealth just for wealth's sake. And that's where the real crime is, is that we take all the oil out of the ground, even though we don't need it for this population, which is you know, why we're in a contraction now. We take all this gold out of the ground, we take everything out of the planet and contaminate it with the effluent from purifying, manufacturing, and other products, etc. Well, then, where is that going to leave future generations? And the more we proceed in that direction now, the sooner it's going to be before future generations sort of come to the age of maturity and say, well, there's really nothing to vote for because there's nothing left to eat, there's nothing left to do. I mean, because we've done it all. Several generations of this kind of behavior will completely wipe out the resource base of the planet. So that's the real crime of this century, is that the incredible capacity for resource consumption that is now ongoing to satisfy the rapacious appetites of a financial elite at the top of the food chain will be the crime of this century. And in future generations, 
they're going to look back and say, wow, what was wrong with us back then? Why could we not control ourselves? 95% of the people didn't live beyond a normal average means, but 5% of these people, they just about wiped out our generation. And so there's a time coming, in my belief, when these captains of industry and these pillars of society are going to be reviled as criminals, and that's how history will remember them. It is amazing who we revere in modern society sometimes. These are basically, they're criminals. Wall Street, the Federal Reserve System, central banks around the world, it's the new version of organized crime. I mean, it makes Al Capone look like Mother Teresa. This is, you know, what, what he did is nothing compared to this. These are giant crimes that are affecting the lives of every person on the planet, possibly. They're well, not just, just on the planet now, too, but in the future. Generations. Yeah, people, right. people yet unborn are right. paying for their complete greed. I mean, it knows no bounds. I tell you, you know, James, years ago, I used to be a little bit more like a knee jerk capitalist <laughs> and loving to see these big, wealthy people like, you know, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and all this stuff. And, and you know, I used to really believe in them, but I don't anymore. I, I think they're part of the big scheme, you know, uh, and I'm not calling them out by name. I'm just saying all, all of their ilk, really. There is just no limit to the power grab of these people and how much they will take, how much of the wealth they will take out of people's lives. You know, inflation, for example, and the debasement of currency is such a slow process most of the time, <laughs> or at least it has right. been historically. And I, I think that's going to change pretty quickly here. It's just sort of like you put the frog in the water, you turn up the heat slowly, and eventually just sits there thinking he's getting a nice warm bath until he's boiling to death. And that is what is happening. People have got to be made more aware of this, which is why I uh, really commend you for what you're doing with your film. Tell us quickly how you finance the film and how we can support you in this effort and, and getting the message out there. Well, we're trying to raise $2 million through donation by talking about the film and the logic underlying it on programs like yours. So far, we're doing it strictly by donation through our website and through public appearances, and we have these various events. $2 million is a lot for a documentary. If you However, care to disclose, uh, how much have you raised thus far? Thus far, we've probably, we're still not through 1.5 million yet. So we're getting there, but we oh. still have a ways to go. Okay, good. Any any um, really big donors in there, or are those a lot of small donations? They're mostly small donations. There are some larger ones. Our larger donors have requested anonymity, uh -huh. and so I have to honor that. Sure. But there's some, some very surprising people have stepped up to the plate. A lot of the individuals, especially a lot of the large donors, actually come from fairly prominent positions within industry, and they're mostly in retirement mode now, and they've sort of reached this point in their life where they've looked back at their role in helping these organizations they've worked for, and they sort of said, my God, I didn't even realize that this is what I was doing. And so they see this film as a way to sort of counterbalance what their role has been in assisting these criminals, you know, rape the planet. That's how we're going to raise all of the money, is hopefully by donation. Now, we've got investors willing to step up if we don't raise the full amount we need for filming, but we're already there for production. Now, uh, And they can donate really... at crimeofthecenturymovie.com, is that correct? That's right, www.crimeofthecenturymovie.com. You can donate any amount. Every little bit helps us. And our goal is to divert $600,000 of the $2 million will be going towards generating an audience for the film when it comes out. Our goal is to have this film seen by the broadest possible audience on its release date, which will be at some point early in 2010. By sticking to a strictly donation model, we're not driven by issues of saleability for the film, and we control the distribution destiny of the film as well. That's fantastic. So I am looking forward to seeing this in lots of theaters, mainstream, because the uh, U.S. population nowadays is just distracted with a bunch of things that just 
don't really matter. <laughs> and and we've got to start paying attention to what's happening to the value of our work, our labors, our thoughts, our ideas, our creativity, our innovation, which is money. That is the result of all of our efforts that we make over the course of our lives. And it is being stolen from people little by little and transferred in the hands of private elites that are just taking the money away from the largely the middle class. That's where it's really coming from because that's where you've got the biggest amount to take, right? Yeah. Anything we can do to protect ourselves, you know, uh, of course we want to support your efforts in the movie. Any advice, you know, you write a fantastic newsletter available at MidasLetter.com. What advice do you have? I mean, it's interesting to understand it. Our listeners know what my advice is. Buy cheap rental properties in areas with really low land costs because we think land is declining in value in most places. Finance it and let inflation, when it comes in a year or two, really start repaying that debt for you by devaluing the value of the debt. Uh, what are your thoughts? That's an excellent strategy. And in terms of investment, I don't think you could do much better. In terms of protecting any stored wealth that you might be holding in, say, U.S. Treasury bills or any U.S. dollar-denominated asset that does not generate the yield associated with it, I know there's lots of people rushing to T-bills, which I think it's today they just announced that the yield on the T-bill is now 0%. <laughs> and so I've been advocating to my subscribers at MidasLetter.com try to transfer as much of their, of their U.S. dollar paper wealth into gold and silver. Do you now, have a preference, gold or silver? I've always gravitated towards gold, but over the last five years that have become more closely associated with the economics of silver, I'm starting to appreciate that gold and silver are the precious metal combination. and They've had a relationship, a fixed relationship over time of, at a ratio of roughly 50 to 1, I believe. The analysts who follow the silver market see that ratio actually shrinking. So there are those out there who would say that silver is the better investment. Now, I'm just not that well versed in the silver market to give that advice myself and I like gold just because it's something I understand historically it's very easy to understand it's, it's very easy to understand where the idea of value comes from when you look at a piece of gold I mean it's worth something but the problem with acquiring gold especially in small denomination ounces which typically come in bars and coins is that a lot of the bullion dealers are having a hard time finding American gold eagles or Krugerrands or... There's a yeah, this is the big disconnect between the spot price and the physical market uh, that we've talked about. Yeah. Try to buy an ounce of gold on, say, eBay, you find that the average spot price of gold on eBay, if you were to average out all of the prices being asked per ounce, is actually closer to $1,000. And so my subscribers come back to me and say, well, the spot price is... 750 and these guys are asking 950 I can't bring myself to pay that because I can't wrap my head around the disconnect and you know all I have to say is if you believe as I do and a lot of other people do who are very close to the gold market that gold is going to go through two thousand dollars an ounce within the year and the upper level of its reach is going to be beyond five thousand dollars an ounce then it's going to make the difference between paying $900 an ounce or $700 an ounce or $800 an ounce one very irrelevant. And so certainly there's some risk involved in transferring your wealth 100% into gold, and I wouldn't recommend that. But certainly I think there's a strong argument for owning the liquid portion of your portfolio, that is the paper dollars, transferring that slowly into gold and silver within the next several months. James West, thank you so much for being on the show. I appreciate it. The listeners will visit your websites. We'll also link to them in the show notes. We appreciate having you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jason. The American Monetary Association is a nonprofit venture funded by the Jason Hartman Foundation, which is dedicated to educating people about the practical effects of monetary policy and government actions on inflation, deflation, and personal freedom. Our goal is to help people prosper in the midst of uncertain economic times. This show is produced by the Jason Hartman Foundation, all rights reserved. For publication rights and media interviews, please visit www.hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com. 
Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate professional if you require individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own, and the host is acting on behalf of the Jason Hartman Foundation exclusively.